So welcome to this event uh, of Brazil Week 2021 at King's College London. Brazil Week, uh, this year we are already celebrating the seventh time that we, seventh year that we are uh, organizing this event, this Brazil Week uh, at, by King's Brazil Institute. Uh, this year in particular, we are uh, happy to, to celebrate uh, this week, um, despite the conditions and the situation that we are living globally. Um, because it's an important year for Brazil Institute. We, in 2020, we celebrate uh, the 10th anniversary of the Institute. Um, and that's a quite important uh, year for us because it shows how important the studies about Brazil and with Brazil has been growing um, and developing in UK and in particular in King's College London. My name is Vinicius de Carvalho, as you can see there. I am lecturer uh, at the Brazil Institute, currently the director of Brazil Institute and also in the Department of War Studies. Um, uh, I am happy today to, to start this last day of our Brazil Week with a group of friends uh, presenting a beautiful project that I think it's another result of this work that has been, uh, been carried on here at King's College London for quite a long time around Brazil even before Brazil Institute was uh, established, as I said, 10 years ago, um, a long tradition of uh, studies about Brazil and with Brazil uh, were here um, in, in the college. And one of those who are a precursor uh, is Professor David Tris that is here with us today. And we'll be talking a little bit uh, about him very soon. Um, the event today is to launch a book series um, called uh, Anthem Brazilian Studies Series. This book series was created two years ago, three years ago, in a partnership between Brazil Institute and Anthem Press. Uh, I am the editor of this series, and I will share with you now uh, the when, uh, main web page of the series that you can check uh, there. What is the main idea behind that? Uh, the the Anthem Brazilian Studies series aims to be a forefront to discussion on Brazilian studies globally. The series takes a holistic and interdisciplinary approach. Titles in the series selected for the originality, innovation, and academic rigor. So uh, in just two years of existence, we are happy that we have already three volumes published, and we will be launching these three volumes today here. And we have already two in the pipeline to come this year in 2021, and probably a third one already. And the first thing we did when we established this, this series was to put together an editorial board. Uh, and when I was composing this board, I was trying to not only cover um, many countries in the world that we, we have people doing Brazilian studies or studies related to Brazil, but also covering different areas um, uh, and also having a sort of uh, uh, a balance a gender, uh, a more gender equality balance, and also representing different aspects of Brazilian studies here. Um, well, if you are interested in submit uh, an application, uh, a submission, a book submission, you can find all the details in our web page here. So you can find uh, how to how to submit uh, a book. So for authors, you have here, and then you can see all the details that you need to do in order to propose a title. Here you have also the, the titles that I said we have already published and one that's coming already this year. Uh, very soon I will post on the chat um, uh, a voucher. If you, if you use the, the voucher code to buy any of those three volumes, you will have a discount. Uh, what's very good when we have a book launch. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about the, the series in general. Um, I will be back here um, and say that we will follow this, the, the, the order of the publications of these volumes, but in the reverse order. We will start by the, the last one that was published, that was um, Affect and Realism in Contemporary Brazilian Fiction. Um, it was, uh, the author is here with us, Kaleric Shorhama. Uh, Kaleric is a good friend of Brazil Institute. He's professor in the uh, Pontifical Catholic University in Rio de Janeiro, and also um, a, a visiting professor at Copenhagen University. Is that right, Kaleric? Yeah, um, we've, we have cooperate, uh, collaborated in the past in Denmark, while I, I used to teach in the Aarhus University and Kaleric was actually one alumni from Aarhus. So the ties uh, of cooperation uh, were already there for quite a long time. And he's also a member of our, uh, our board 
in the in the book uh, series. Um, well, what how it will work uh, this this presentation of books here? We have two edit volumes and one um, one monographic book. Uh, the monographic book, uh, Caleric will talk a little bit about his. Uh, his idea behind the book, and then Luciana Gattas will, uh, as a reader, make her own comments on, on the book and about the relevance of the book. For the edit volumes, the main editors, they will be talking about the idea behind the book, the history of the book, and comment on the articles, because they also were the readers of the, 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 the chapters of the other contributors. So um, I will pass now the word to, to Caleric, and he can start talking about uh, his own his own production here, his own book, um, and then Luciana on continuation. Thank you again for joining us here, and Caleric is with you now. Thank you very much, Vinicius, and uh, thank you very much for everybody who uh, are together with us uh, today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the project of my book. Um, uh, on uh, effect and realism in contemporary Brazilian uh, fiction. And the focus of this book is uh, a discussion of uh, Brazilian fiction, uh, mainly focused on the production of the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, the, the book is a result of my uh, research uh, that has been performed over the past years, uh, always trying to discuss uh, the production of fiction uh, and spe specifically the fiction concerned with the possibilities of a literary intervention in reality of uh, the historical moment. Thus, um, exploring the actual role of literature is a strategic in the definition of the contemporary. And uh, I, the book starts with the hypothesis of a certain optimism among current writers uh, and also artists with respect to the aesthetical, ethical and political role of literature and art uh, in the end of the 20th century and the beginning of uh, the 21st century. For this reason, uh, they are, as you can see uh, from the title, uh, like two perspectives of reading uh, standing out. Uh, on one hand, you have a revised understanding of realism, and on the other, uh, a discussion of the relevance of effect in the assessment of the role of literary production in current Brazilian literature, uh, with an emphasis on the relation between realism and effect. Uh, current approaches like representation and interpretation are abandoned as uh, a primordial axis of reading. And instead, uh, I'm trying to go deep in an explanation of the historical experience uh, uh, in the aesthetic exper uh, in exter experience itself. I mean, uh, trying to connect the historical experience and aesthetic experience. And from this perspective, the goal uh, will show how reality is, is manifested in the body uh, of uh, the reading experience uh, in the way, for instance, that the word, that the work uh, touches its reader like an atmosphere, like a sensible climate uh, of attunement or disharmony uh, and leave a mark of the physical and material encounter that is performed uh, in reading. And uh, that at the same time promotes a concrete historical mediation uh, with its specific context and environment. Right? Recent literary studies of Brazil uh, will generally uh, accept that there are uh, a transformation in the 1960s and the 1970s uh, of Brazilian literature from a narrative mainly situated in regional areas in the backlands uh, going uh, to appear now uh, of the big city as a contradictory scenario for national literature. Novelists and short story writers who are consolidated at that time, uh, encountering the big cities of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro and other capitals, a reality that not only brought a promise of modernity, but also produced a 
civic marginality that became uh, uh, that came with extreme poverty, with violence, uh, and also with organized crime. In the 1990s and the 2000s, uh, a generation of writers appeared who uh, revived programmatic principles of this urban prose and who began the new century with a new demand for the real. Such a demand included references from historical realism and at the same time preserved a desire to experiment aesthetically in search of effect and effects uh, through a performative writing that was articulated in the translation of the historical temporality, mainly in the exploration of the lived presence. The narrative that I will discuss in the book uh, are situated in a spatial referentiality that abandons the, image, the imaginary construction of the nation, uh, an important task of modern literature in favor of stories that are globalized by exploring ways to include Brazilian culture uh, and language in new international networks. Uh, it is my hope and ambition that this book in a similar fashion will enhance the discussion of Brazilian fiction and explore the relevance that contemporary literary experimentation uh, in Brazil at this moment has for a general understanding of the role of literature in a contemporary uh, global uh, context. Uh, thank, thank you so much uh, for uh, attending this session and I hope that you will enjoy the book. Thank you so much, Kaleric, for your introduction of this, this book. Uh, as I said, um, that's the first monographic um, book in the book series. And we are sure that uh, many other colleagues will be interested in the future in consider uh, to publish with us in this in, in this fantastic series. Um, I would like now to pass the word to Luciana, uh, who is a reader of this book, and then she she can tell from the perspective of of a reader how she she would receive a sort of a, 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 a read or a sad review of the book for us. Thanks, Luciana, for joining us. Thank you for having me, and thank you to my eternal professor Carl Eric for for extending the this honor, which is to review his book, um, which in I, which allows me to segue directly into the text, because I believe this book to be the result of two passions in the author. Uh, one is his love of Brazilian culture and literature, and the other is his eternal devotion to a literary theory itself. As a rooted cosmopolitan, an honorary Brazilian Danish emigre, Carl Eric retains that oblique perspective into a foreign culture, which both blesses and curses him to oscillate between the proverbial outsider's view and the insider's look. The latter authorizes him to assess works with the kind of frankness only attained through intimacy or rather only afforded to loving relatives honor bound to speak up in the face of the occasional underachievement. The result is an uncompromised, non-synthetical, sincere in the Foucauldian sense, look at Brazilian prose of the last 20 years through the lens of the two axes which give the book its title, namely realism, overhauled as it may be, and affect. Carl Eric's reader is then tasked with adopting something akin to that parallax view of which he speaks and resist all manner of simplification. And yet what other kind of gaze would suit a venture into that elusive thing, which is the contemporary? In a felicitous paraphrasing of George Agamben, Carl Eric reminds us that, quote, the contemporary is he who has the courage to recognize and commit to a present with which it is not possible to coincide." Unquote. I can think of no better descriptor for the author himself. That said, Carl Eric is no ordinary cosmopolitan and his higher allegiance is not to a geographic place, but to the province of theory itself. The Thoroughline is a defense of literature as a space of ideation 
as an instrument of transformation, as an unparalleled articulator of human time, even as it drowns in a mediascape obsessed with self-writing, even in light of recent Brazilian political scenarios, as it attempts to stave off the anachronistic tentacles of neo-authoritarianism. Methodologically, this means dissecting aesthetics in the service of ethics, or simply put, the reading of prose as a gateway to theory. By refusing to synthesize antinomies, Carl Eric masterfully situates Brazilian contemporary fiction within a larger epistemic frame, one wherein a present bloated with pasts and closed off to the future has installed itself as a phenomenological condition, one wherein both emancipatory hopes and dictatorial dreams of sorry, dictatorial demons simultaneously, I'm sorry. simultaneously insinuate themselves into the desire to speak with the real. Paramount here is the diagnosis that the present has ceased to act as a bridge between the past and the future, where the modernist now promised redemption. The contemporary present, quote, breaks the backbone of history and offers neither rest nor reconciliation no rest nor reconciliation. It is through this sinuous path that affect and realism in contemporary Brazilian fiction traverses the prose produced in this young and fragile democracy in the last two decades. An exploration of the novels by the two Paulus, Scott and Linz, for example, seamlessly evolves into a revisiting of historical realism which freed from the representational impetus seeks now immersion in affects and effects. Michelle Laub's Diary of the Fall prompts an excursus into Benjamin, Freud, in a dialogue with Seltzer's wound culture. An analysis of Bernard Kukinski facilitates a discussion of Eichmann and one of Paulo Coelho reveals the pitfalls of sacrificing quality for the sake of marketability. Unreluctant to abandon classic frameworks such as representation and hermeneutics, the book adopts a perspectivism located on the margins, which the author himself admits to being the perfect, quote, platform for sharp criticism, unquote. And that not simply of Brazilian contemporary prose in its self-enclosed aesthetics, but perhaps more importantly, in its ethical connection to transnational networks and discourses. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your reading, uh, Lucien. I think it uh, really, really brings a uh, sort of contextualization of the position of Caleric as an intellectual in Brazil and especially in this book. No? Uh, I think who who are familiar with uh, his production. No, we have been working with his, his previous works. We can see here a continuation of a, a path of a development of an intellectual path um, that is, is quite relevant for today. Uh, so we will have time for questions or comments. You, we have a QA and a uh, box uh, in, our, in our Zoom. So in the audience, if you have questions or comments, please use the Q&A um, uh, square here. Um, we will move now to the second book in this in this launch is um, Music, si Sense and Migration, Space and Transnationalism in Brazil, Portugal and the Atlantics. Uh, this was edited by uh, Dave Dietrich, our colleague. I mentioned before, uh, Dave is a professor, it's, it's the Camões professor uh, at King's College London in the Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies uh, Department. Dave is a, is a Brazilianist that is very well known for everyone who studies Brazilian literature, culture, and music, has a large production in this field. Um, before Brazil Institute was established, as I said, David already uh, was also the director of a, a center for Brazilian studies uh, at King's. 
So um, he he's one of these founders of the, the studies of Brazil at King's College London. And we are very proud of having him as an uh, affiliate member of Brazil Institute um, and personally as a friend and colleague uh, in, the, in the college. And as, the, as editor of the series, I was very honored when David came with the proposal to, to publish this collection here because he will say more about that, I'm sure, but um, this book uh, is started to be conceived in one event that we organized a few years ago uh, in, in which uh, we had the presence of, of Martin da Vila uh, as a, let's say the keynote speaker opening that conference. And we, we had a beautiful conference with a lot of performances uh, also, what I think was uh, very good to, to bring life to what we were doing uh, when we were talking about music. So David, thanks again for joining us here. And now it's with you to present the, the book and the contributions of the book also. Thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Vinicius. And uh, good morning, everyone, uh, colleagues. Um, it's really wonderful to be um, celebrating actually the, the 10 years of the, of the Brazil Institute. Um, as Vinicius says, you know, as somebody who was around at the beginning of the, the Institute, um, it's been marvellous just to see it flourishing under um, Anthony Pereira's leadership and now under the leadership of, um, of Vinicius. So congratulations for all your wonderful work, fantastic contribution to Brazilian studies internationally and in the UK. And congratulations um, to Vinicius and to, to Anthem for this Brazil series. Um, it's a really great initiative. Uh, wonderful to have you know, a special imprint dedicated to, to Brazil and to Brazilian studies. And um, you know, it's, it's a real pleasure to be a part of the launch of this first wave of, of publications. I want to take the opportunity also to thank the, the editorial and production team for a wonderful job in bringing um, our book to, to fruition um, and to the work of our, of our translators. As Vinicius says, um, uh, music scenes and migrations came out of uh, an event uh, that we held at King's back in 2016, uh, a symposium, an international symposium uh, called City to City, Urban Crossroads in the Music of Africa, Brazil, and Portugal, uh, and it brought together uh, researchers from within uh, the King's Research Group in Brazilian Music, um, with the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, my own department of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies, a central role of the King's Brazil Institute and Vinicius, and uh, the uh, very important support of the Brazilian Embassy. Um, and it brought together a really exciting community of scholars, um, based in Brazil, Portugal and Europe, um, many of whom, most of whom uh, are contributors to the, to the volume, others we invited to contribute uh, later on, um, and who are really have been producing cutting edge research um, on uh, aspects of musical activity, of music making uh, across the region. And the fact that we used in the title of that event, City to City, the notion of urban crossroads, pointed towards our interest in uh, a very transnational view of the relationship between music, space and place as a phenomenon that's dynamic, mobile, fluid, in a continual state of tension between, on the one hand, the stability and fixity of location and identity in music making, and on the other hand, the flux of musical transformation and movement. Um, in looking at the Lusophone world, the Portuguese speaking world, the Lusophone Atlantic and its key cities, such as Rio de Janeiro and Lisbon, um, we identify a really prime example of that kind of dialectic between location centeredness and movement on the other hand. Um, and that's something that I've been very interested in, in looking at ideas of a um, Lusophone Black Atlantic in, in other work. So what we've really 
been moved by is a shift away from center periphery models of thinking, the idea of a metropolitan cultural source or origin which uh, spreads its influences across an empire um, uh, whose, whose constituent parts react to it, to move away from that to something that is more uh, transnational, that's more concerned with exchanges, with dialogues, um, and with networks. The key words in conceptualizing music making along these lines in our book, therefore, are cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism migration, the Atlantic, and in particular, this idea of music scenes, um, a word that many people might be familiar with at a sort of popular level for talking about uh, the world of music. But in academic discourse, it's come to define uh, a way of thinking about the intersections in musical life between territory, physical territory, uh, genre, and social activity. So in addressing this uh, dialectic between place, location, space, and movement, um, what we've done is to organize the contributions to the volume in three key um, thematic areas. The first group of essays um, fall under the heading colonial and post-colonial transnationalisms, migrations and diasporas. And as that title suggests, this means that they focus on the musical movements and fluxes that have crossed the Atlantic world since the colonial period. They include the diasporic extensions of African music making across the Atlantic world. And the volume opens with an essay by Luis Moreto on who, Luis being a, a PhD graduate of, of King's. Um, Luis Moreto's essay is on the, the transcultural heritage of bowed stringed lutes, such as the Simboa. That's followed by um, an essay on the role of early forms of mechanical music recording in mediating between Portuguese and Brazilian popular songs across the Atlantic in 19th century Rio de Janeiro. That's an essay by Marta Tupinambá called Lundu's Street Organs, Music Boxes and the Cachucha. We have an essay looking at the story of Musica Caipira and its role in articulating the migratory experience of the Sao Paulo peasantry in the 20th century by Ivan Vilela, not only um, a, a very eminent scholar, but also uh, one of the leading expert proponents of the viola caipira itself. Um, we also have an essay looking at the ways in which lusophone hip hop over the last 20 years has engaged critically and creatively with the idea of lusophonia as expressive of a multicultural form of cosmopolitan community. That's a contribution from Bart van Spaun. And we look in this section at the contemporary phenomenon of Brazilian musicians living abroad in the cities of Lisbon and Madrid and how they negotiate the needs and expectations of their expatriate communities, of tourists, of local audiences. Um, and this is addressed in essays by Amanda Guerreiro and Gabby Hoskin, respectively. So after that section on transnationalisms, migrations and diasporas, we move to a, an urban centre, a key urban centre in relocating Rio de Janeiro. And here we look um, in great depth and detail at how in its identification with key musical traditions, such as samba, pagodi and shoro, the city of Rio has been a contested space, contested geographically, symbolically and politically whether in the memories and mythologies of key neighborhoods and locations of music making, as expressed in the musical discourses themselves in the songs, beautifully recounted in an essay by Claudia Neva Gimatos called Samba, Its Places and Its City, or through music's involvement in the material forms of community life and popular culture, including religion, carnival and other festivals that's explored in Fabiana Lopez da Cunha's essay, between temple yards and hillsides, in the ways that a canonical space, as Mikhail Hirschman and Felipe Trotter put it in their essay, 
has been constructed for Samba and Shorter within the musical marketplace, or as heritage within the discourses and policies of state institutions such as Funarchi, as Tania da Costa Garcia explores in her essay. Alternatively, the Samba tradition and its meaning for living working class suburban communities has been reclaimed as in Candea's anti-racist Quilombo project of the 1970s, which I examine in my chapter, or has been reinvented as in the case of 1980s Pagogi, which is the theme of Valgir Giamorin Pinto's essay. So we move back out from the urban entrepot of Rio de Janeiro, back out into the, the ocean of contemporary sand, into the third section of our book, which is entitled Demetropolitanizing the Musical City, Other Scenes, Industries and Technologies. And here we explore how contemporary developments in the independent underground and peripheral music scenes in Brazil and Portugal have challenged traditional notions of musical place and hierarchy. Several of the essays explore these trends um, and work with topics where geographical locatedness is still familiarly connected to cities or their neighborhoods, but in two cases, the idea of musical location moves in a fascinating new direction. First, Marcia Tosta Gias examines the independent record company, Baratos Afins, which as a recording label, as a studio and a record store housed in a Sao Paulo shopping arcade, functioned from the early 1980s as an extraordinary focus and a reference point for musical activity and consumption ranging across jazz, rock, instrumental music, and MITB. And second, Simone Pereira de Sá gives us a fascinating analysis of digital culture and YouTube video consumption, mapping what she terms the peripheral Brazilian pop music network, a field dominated by genres such as sertanejo and funk. Then, Daniela Vieira de Santos looks at the post-1990s hip-hop movement of the Sao Paulo periphery, a new school generation represented by the rapper Emicida. Daniela examines how Emicida addresses the national myths of cordiality and social mobility. And in fact, I could say that her essay gives us a, a wonderful way into interpreting Emicida's recent film, Amarelo, which some of you might have seen, but you can catch on uh, dare I say, on Netflix. And in this section of the book, we also get a deep exploration of the concept of the musical scene, which is at the heart of uh, the concept. Both in Gede Janotti Junior's study of heavy Brazilian music, Musica Pesada Brasileira, Sepultura and the Reinvention of Brazilian Sound, and in Paula Guerra's concluding essay on underground music in contemporary Portugal, another music in a different and unstable room. And with that intriguing closing title, I hope that, uh, that you'll want to find out more. Um, as I say, I'm very proud, we are very proud to be bringing this cutted, cutting edge work um, from such a wonderful group of scholars uh, and to be a part of the Anthem series. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, David, for, for this uh, summary of uh, what the book is about. And I think one of the most important elements that for me as, as uh, the editor, I was looking at the book is we, and in the conference house, we escaped from that easy um, classification of Brazilian music, uh, so, so full of um, stereotypes and especially escaping from the frame of the traditional nationalism way of looking at Brazilian music as, as a sort of exclusivity uh, and not looking at the dialogues of, uh, of this music. And before we move on, I would like to share with you a, a web page in where you can see in this brazilinstitute.org, if you go in activities, city to city urban crosswords, you can have here um, um, the lecture by Martin da Villa translated by David, um, the performance of King's Brazil Ensemble playing uh, A Noiva do Condutor by Noel Rosa, um, the closing, the roundtable discussion that we had for the closing of the conference, a sort of um, closing performances that people that were participating were just playing um, to enjoy. And also uh, you can have, uh, I think, uh, 
we, we used to have here also the, the lectures one by one, but I can't find it right now. But in any case, you can have a good idea of what, what we are doing or what we did in this, this conference and that result in this book. Uh, and again, we are very proud of hosting that um, in Brazil Institute and exactly in this, this series with Antim Press. Um, I repeat, if you want to, 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 to bring some questions or comments, please use the Q&A uh, box here. And I will move to the last book of the, or the first book indeed, and that was published as we did in the reverse order. It is this one, Magazines and Modernities in Brazil, um, trans Transnational Networks and Cross-Cultural Exchange. Uh, exchange uh, edited by Felipe Botelho Correia, Monica Pimenta Veloso, and Valeria dos Santos Guimarães. Um, <coughs> Felipe is a colleague of us at King's also. He, he uh, started working at SPLAS, Spanish Portuguese Latin American Studies Department, and uh, now in, in liberal arts. Uh, he's also the chief editor of Brasiliana Journal for Brazilian Studies, another initiative that we have at King's College London. And for those who are thinking about submit articles on Brazilian studies, please look at Brasiliana. Um, and yes, Felipe, now it's with you and you can talk about the idea of the book and uh, what the book is about. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vinicius, for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I'd like to uh, say hello to my, my colleagues, Debbie Tracy and Caleric, myself being uh, a graduate from Puki. Uh, have been taught by Carl Eric, uh, so it's nice to have uh, to share the, the, the session with him uh, and with my colleague Dave as well. And hello to, to Luciana. Um, I'll be uh, I'll be brief about this this book. I want to present it um, the, the main ideas, and I think one of the connections that I can see with uh, particularly with uh, David's uh, book is, is the emphasis on the question of uh, transnationalism or the transnational approach. And uh, as an edited collection, this, this book is trying to interrogate um, that idea uh, within the field of within, with the focus on periodicals or print culture, more specifically on, on magazines. Um, and this book is coming out of uh, um, a research group, which is fairly large, uh, based in Brazil. It's a CNPq group, and it's called Imprensa e Circulação de Ideias, o papel dos periódicos uh, no século XIX e XX. So the role of um, uh, periodicals in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, this, group, this group has been um, holding uh, annual meetings uh, for a few years now. And uh, in one of those meetings, uh, I was speaking with uh, Monica Pimenta Veloso from Casa de Rui Barbosa. Uh, and we were thinking about how, how we could actually um, start publishing in English. And this is something that I've seen in many uh, Brazilian academics, Brazilian colleagues, having this drive to uh, now write in English and expand uh, the readership. And we're thinking about ways to do that. And that's kind of the seed of the, of the book. I think it's probably uh, the same years as, as the symposium that David mentioned, so 2016. We started the book and then we, we, we gathered the collection uh, of, uh, of um, about eight writers all of them discussing magazines. Uh, and I think one of the, the key issues or the key um, points of this book, the, what is uh, innovative, it is it's the first book about magazines uh, in Brazil that is published in English. Uh, so I, I cannot find uh, any book that is dedicated to, to, uh, to magazines um, in Brazil and it's been published in English. And the, the time frame, uh, it's from the mid 19th century up to the aftermath of World War II. Uh, all chapters are discussing specific magazines, but making uh, connections with, uh, with networks, international networks or transnational networks. And uh, the, the idea of cross-culture exchanges, so rather than uh, emphasizing the idea of, the, of influence, so one country influencing the other, one magazine influencing the other, 
how there is a circulation uh, of, of those kind of models for, for magazines and how they appear in Brazil and how Brazil can, can talk to the world in a way, be example uh, to a, a more a broader, a broader discussion. So there's no question on, on nation or nationalism per se, it's more trying to critique uh, those questions. So uh, not to miss uh, the, the description of the chapters, what each author says, I will just read a, a brief uh, description. Uh, but, and I will start with uh, making a reference for, to another book, uh, which was interesting. Uh, it was published in 2009, and it's called the Paul Gray Dictionary of Transnational History from mid-19th century to the present day. Uh, what I thought it was interesting about this book, I was researching all the entries, there, over 400 entries there, and that there are entries on the specific countries, uh, such as Japan and China, but there is an, an entry on, on Brazil. Brazil appears uh, in pieces here and there in, on topics such as uh, abolitionism, anthropophagia, city planning, consumer cooperation, uh, cuisines, uh, debt crisis, diasporas, uh, empire, migration, film, jazz, um, liberation the theology, you know, all kinds of race mixing, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, different topics, transnational topics that are now discussed as transnational topics, but not as an entry in itself. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it is not a surprise to see that strong presence of transnational terms referring to Brazil. Um, and I think it points to a complex uh, transnational connections that have recently been explored in the field of Brazilian studies. In other words, Brazilian studies not in, uh, in connection with Brazil only, but Brazilian studies in connection with the world. How can we study Brazil uh, having not just a national perspective, but an international one? Uh, or directly or indirectly, the essays gather in this book, the magazines in modernity in Brazil, um, they explore further these uh, transnational topics. Uh, and the chapters, uh, let me just uh, scroll down here. Um, it is organized chronologically. Uh, and the the chapters start with uh, Valeria de Santos Guimarães, one of the edits. She provides a detailed map of the circulation of French magazines in Brazil throughout the 19th century and 20th century. And she uses catalogs and advertisements published by agents, libraries and booksellers, uh, as well as those that appeared in periodicals. And she argues that these publications in French reflected the ways in which Brazilians regarded French culture as a reference in terms of engagement with modernity, more than any other periodical print culture. She shows how the circulation of these magazines in two uh, major cities, uh, Rio and São Paulo, uh, fostered a negotiation of local mediators with the growing global Francophonie, uh, which had periodicals as one of its key components. The, the second essay, uh, which is, um, is written by, by myself, I focus on the, uh, the emergence of, of uh, what I call popular, illustra popular illustrated magazines uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, this is um, a model of publishing that uh, emerged in the, the, basically the last decades of the, of the century in various parts of the world, in the, in the US and in Europe. Uh, it was characterized by, um, by a mass circulation rather than a more restricted circulation. Um, in the case of Brazil, I'm bringing this uh, to, I analyzing three different um, examples uh, that appeared in the first decade of the 20th century. So, uh, Omar, Liu Fong Fong, and Careta. Um, and interestingly, these, these periodicals. Uh, they became uh, one of the first ways to connect the country to the greater print culture that is national, but national in connection with the other countries as well. So before radio was able to do that, or even before television, uh, these periodicals were circulated into uh, various parts of the country. And 
they coincidentally they ceased publication in the 19th, late 1950s when television was taking over as one of the of the medium. Uh, and I, what I look at specifically in these essays is the question of, uh, of uh, uh, the representation of uh, race mixture um, in, in, in a figure that's called uh, uh, Ze, Ze Povo, that appears in this magazine that's the, uh, kind of the representation of the uh, man in the street or the citizen from everyday life and how race has been a, a key part of the expansion of this readership. And then uh, we have another essay on by Monica Pimenta Veloso focusing on the circulation of modernist magazines uh, beyond the normal uh, uh, cities like Paris, London and Berlin. And she selects the case study uh, of a Belgian magazine that's called Lumière uh, and, and its vast uh, transnational networks. Uh, the, the editor was uh, Roger Avermaet, Avermaet. And this, mag this magazine uh, gathered collaborations from one uh, key Brazilian modernism, Sergio Millier. Uh, and uh, she explores how, uh, or the connections between these magazine and the modernist movements in Brazil, particularly in terms of uh, the connection with the uh, magazine such as Clarkson and, and, and Estetica. Then Marisa Malta discusses uh, uh, one magazine that's called A Casa, um, and, and in connection with the, the idea of shelter magazine, which is a type of publication. And again, she explores uh, how there is a transnational model for, uh, for household magazines and what was the role of ACASA in the 1920s and 1940s. It's basically showing how uh, an, an accelerated process of modernization uh, was appearing not only in the architecture of houses, but also in the interior of the houses and how these magazines were, were playing a role in, in, in this moment in history. And then we move on to uh, the text by uh, the chapter by Mateus Cardoso da Silva and Renato Alencar Dota. Um, they explore the, the periods of the 1930s and, and 40s and how the Nazi fascist ideas uh, spread in various countries with uh, magazines helping to disseminate these ideologies. And they show how the Brazilian magazine Panorama was one of several magazines that made up uh, the range of publications supported by far-right movement Ação Integralista Brasileira in the 1930s, uh, which itself boasted about being part of a global network of far-right groups. Uh, so apart from national politics, Panorama also featured many pieces that had been published in Europe, and as well as commissioned articles written by foreign authors, sympathetic or even members of various fascist movements in countries such as uh, Italy, Germany, the United States. And they show uh, how these this far-right connections appear in periodicals and how the magazine was playing a role in, in Brazil. Then Joel Rousseau shows um, how the magazine Diretrizes, which was published briefly between 1938 and 44 uh, during the Estado Novo, uh, can be seen as a counterpoint to Panorama. So there is a, a, a dialogue between these two chapters. So it gives a, a, a detailed account of how uh, Samuel Weiner, one of key editors uh, in Brazil, uh, at the time it was very young, uh, but basically he transforms the editorial line of the magazine, um, eventually making it a, a, a bastion for those against the, the dissemination of Nazi fascism in, in Brazil, uh, until it is seized, uh, the publication is seized by Getúlio Vargas in, in 1944. Then Tânia Regina de Luca explores how the, the practices of uh, surveys literary inquiries and, and, and interviews, um, which originated, originated in the 19th century, were used in the 1940s to support uh, political, sociological and journalistic discourses uh, about modernism in Brazil. She specifically focused on uh, Revista do Brasil during World War II, uh, showing how, uh, how the editors 
uh, updated this inquiry. So they usually send uh, um, questions, a list of uh, questions to uh, key cultural mediators or key intellectuals at the time, uh, and they would publish their responses to those questions. Uh, and that kind of created and gave a snapshot of the moment, of the intellectual moment. And she's under, trying to understand uh, how uh, Hevisod Brazil was using that kind of uh, method to uh, create an intellectual snapshot of the 1940s in Brazil. Uh, and finally, to the, the book finishes with uh, a chapter by Claudio de Oliveira analyzing how a magazine called Sombra, which was published between the 1940s and 60s, uh, engaged with the political and cultural projects of, of the Brazilian elites uh, in the aftermath of the World War II. Um, such projects were uh, underpinned by the legacy of modernism discussed in, in other chapters. Um, and, and Sombra is, is a magazine that for its time had a very modern layout uh, and a very well-known national and international collaborators in the fields of arts, literature and photography and became a reference for, for the upper classes um, and uh, uh, creating a kind of a, a, a social etiquette uh, about what is to be a Brazil, Brazilian, but what more specifically, what is what it means to be a Brazilian from the upper classes. Uh, and she uh, engages with these materials uh, and, uh, and argues that Sombra can be seen as a handbook teaching and regulating the practices and representations of the elite uh, society from Rio and Sao Paulo. So I think, um, just as, as a conclusion, I think the chapters of this book, uh, they deliberately move away from the, the traditional comparative approach uh, in which, uh, you know, two or more nations are set as, as a parameter, as a parameter uh, and leading to an emphasis on their um, similarities and difference in a more kind of a rigid framework. Um, but it this kind of comparative, comparative approach does not take into account interactions and cross-pollination of cultures and ideas, which is uh, the emphasis of the book itself. Um, some of the key words that appear uh, in the chapters are um, uh, transnational models, global circulation, mediation, uh, hybridity, mestizage, as well as uh, histories that are shared and connected. And uh, just to, to note that it should, the book shouldn't be seen as um, to suggest, I suppose, singularity of Brazil uh, or the Brazilian case in those transnational cases. It's more of a contribution uh, of the opposite of this, showing how modernity in Brazil including what is conventionally called modernism, is a complex expression of transnational movements and cross-cultural exchanges that can be seen also through the lenses of, uh, of Brazil. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe, for, for presenting the book and giving details about the chapters of it. Um, well, we, we have said that we, the, the session would go until 11. We are five minutes to there. Uh, but if you agree, we could continue a little bit more uh, and have some, some questions if the audience have uh, some comments to us here. Um, just to not finish this abruptly, um, I, I just would like to say that I'm very proud of having these three volumes as, um, as the, the, the start or the beginning of the, the, the series in Anthem Press. Um, I think they, they speak very well what we are trying to do with this series is not, again, talking about the exclusivity of Brazil, but it's much more how these processes of dialogues and exchange, they happen globally. And Brazil is part of this exchange actively. So it's not only looking at Brazil, but also how Brazil is looking to what's going on around the world. And uh, it's difficult to say that this book has something in common, the three of them, but I think uh, this, this, this main frame is there. Uh, everyone in every one of those books, they are looking at that, this dialogue that Brazil establishes with what's going on, what is going on in the world in different times, in different statics, in different contexts. Um, for one who, who is not familiar with this series, probably will think that's a series on humanities 
or arts because these three first volumes were on magazines, literature and music. <coughs> But I just want to say that the, the series is open for, for other, um, other areas also. And just, just to let you know, in 2021, we will be launching two other volumes already. One, it's called Soccer and Realism. Uh, sorry, Soccer and Racism. The beginnings of football in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro between 1895 and 1933. So it's a, a discussion on football and, and race issues. And the other one, and that's by Rosana Barbosa. And the other one by Thomas Frulich, it's Brazil's international ethanol strategy, Lula's quest for a global uh, biofuel market. So we can see that the topics vary a lot in, in different areas. And I think that's what makes this series very rich uh, and interesting again to put Brazil into this global dialogue. Um, before we move to the, to the audience, if we have questions there, um, just remember that we have on the chat um, details about a voucher that you can get 20% of discount in all the books and the, how, to, how to use this voucher there. Um, so do we have any questions from the audience here in our Q&A? There is nothing written, but if you want to, to write something here or make a comment, or even the colleagues that are presenting their books, if they have comments or questions to each other, also would be, would be a rich debate, I think. I do have a question. Do you? Yeah, uh, it's for my colleagues. It's, it's for David and, uh, and Carl Eric. Go ahead. Um, <coughs> is, I mean, we are part of this in a way of this, uh, but how do you see um, this uh, internationalization of, uh, of Brazil, um, Brazilian scholars in particular, uh, writing more in English that I mentioned, do you think this is uh, something that you also noticed uh, in the past decades or so? Um, it's, it's more of a comment to see how you're feeling or how you sense this, this moment. Um, I don't know if Carl Eric or, or David has any, any knowledge of this, but it, it seems to me that the, there is a drive to inter internationalize uh, uh, the production of uh, Brazilian academics writing more in English. Uh, if, you, if I may uh, just uh, give a personal observation on this and uh, uh, thank you uh, for all of your contributions here and very nice to see you here, Felipe. I didn't manage to say good, uh, good day to you in the beginning. Uh, I think that um, this is obviously a global tendency. Uh, there is also a global globalization of the academic uh, market uh, as such. But uh, in Brazil, I think that it is probably uh, uh, a sign of a stronger integration of Brazilian scholars into international institutions and also uh, a sign of uh, the uh, the projects that are uh, launched by uh, national uh, foundations like uh, CAPIS, for instance, uh, and programs like uh, CAPIS Print, where you have a direct uh, incentive to publish together with uh, scholars from other countries. And I think that is part of a, a very important uh, uh, conscience about how uh, uh, how it is necessary actually to to insert the, the national production in an international uh, framework. Perhaps I could add that it strikes me that that we'd have to see this phenomenon, you know, in the context of the the, the political and economic forces that are at work. I mean, I um. You know, I follow discussion threads of, of my Brazilian colleagues, for example, working in the area of, um, of music studies, um, who are contending both on the one hand with the pressures to publish, particularly in English, um, and the interest in publishing in English. You know, there are sort of countervailing forces sometimes, um, some of which have to do with the uh, very laudable interest that we all have in sharing our work and being able to 
um, go beyond the language boundaries of our particular disciplines and fields. But on the other hand, the push of institutions, of funding agencies, which are, you know, have their own kind of economic and political imperative uh, that dictates, well, what's worth uh, more is a publication in a given language or in a given uh, journal or in a given, um, you know, culture. So there are these, these political problems. Um, on the other hand, I know that one of the concerns that, that uh, Vinicius has in, in, you know, leading the Brazil Institute now um, uh, is the question of um, the accessibility of um, scholars outside of a country like Brazil to traditions of intellectual production and, and knowledge um, from the country. The, you know, the, the um, shameful <laughs> um, lack of uh, editions of key works still, of, you know, all sorts of key works from um, uh, Brazilian philosophy, political science, etc. in English. Um, so I think it's not just, you know, at the level of um, perhaps academic articles published in journals abroad, but also, uh, you know, major works that we need to be addressing uh, that, that question. It's still a major challenge. I think, yeah, there is certainly a, a phenomenon of, of internationalization. Um, but it still it still has to contend with the uh, the, the the realities of um, you know of publishing markets that are dominated by the English language um, and those other you know forces that I talked about. Uh, I think the question and the answers helped me a lot to answer uh, the question that uh, Courtney Campbell just wrote to us in the Q and A. First of all, Courtney, thank you for joining us. Um, I just want to say that she is also part of the of the editorial board of this series, um, <clears throat> a good friend and colleague in the University of Birmingham, who has dedicated quite a lot of her academic career looking at Brazil also. So uh, Courtney is asking to me uh, and say, I think you just addressed this in part, and I recognize that is an impossible question, but could you speak a bit to the personality or identity that you see in this series cultivating? Well, um, I think um, my colleagues helped me to answer this question. The main idea is how to, how to integrate more the Brazilian community, a scholar community, not of Brazilians, but those working with Brazil, how integrating them globally more, how to make this idea circulate more easily and more fluently and be capable of also um, um, inseminate new studies. And um, I think it's still very early to say that, but I foresee this series being also a space where we can cultivate a process of decolonizing curricula, where we can bring more voices from Brazil and not again, it's not to look at Brazil simply, but also how these Brazilian voices or these voices of Brazilianists can help to understand global issues. And we have a lot of global issues that we share, the questions of gender, questions of race, questions of inequalities that can be addressed in many aspects in that we live strongly in Brazil, but we also uh, have a, a important group of intellectuals, scholars, thinking and contributing to, to change this picture in some way. And I think um, that probably would be uh, if we, uh, normally we can say like, the, the, if, we, if we make a metaphor with a child, I imagine that parents normally dream about the personality that their children, uh, they would like to have. And the children grew up and have their, their own personalities. So it's very difficult to, to make sure that this child, this series will have the personality and the identity that I dream for it. But I think um, it's, it's important to, to also leave this a space of freedom that this series and the contributions that will come will help to build up uh, this, this identity. And I hope that in many years time, we can look back and see, well, this series really grew up building an identity and an identity that today it's an important identity and personality in the dialogue uh, about Brazilian studies in the world. I hope that I have answered your question, Courtney. And if my colleagues would like to, to also come in the, into discussion. <clears throat> So I have no comments from them. Um, well, we are over our time here already. Um, 
again, I just would like to thank you all the people in the audience and the colleagues uh, who present their books that submit their, their work for publication. Luciana, for your close reading and comments on, on Caleric book, I think enriched a lot because here we have another voice looking at the book and telling where we can, where we can find <coughs> points that will enrich the, the debate on literature in Brazil today. Um, again, um, I'm very happy to, I think I have another one here. Oh, okay, Thomas, is, thanks for mentioning my upcoming book, of course, Thomas. Um, I think we, we can come to a, a closing remarks here for this, this morning. Uh, in in UK and in Brazil, more morning than 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 here, of course. Um, um, again, celebrating the, the the launching of this series, and again reinforcing how this series is open, and there is not a singular agenda here, but it's really an open debate and open forum forum to bring new ideas around and about and with Brazil. So I encourage colleagues to submit their their work. Uh, the reality is here. It's not a series that is in the dreams. It's the, the baby. The baby is born, uh, and now it's time to feed this this baby and make it grow and and multiply also um, in the future. Uh, it it for me it's a great honor to edit this this series because I have a great group of uh, members of the editorial board, and it's been a work of community. It's been a fantastic communitarian work uh, to, to make this, these books coming out. We can see uh, the correlations or the familiarities and genealogies that we have among the authors, editors, uh, even in different moments of our life. That shows very well that there is a vivid and livid community of Brazilianists around. Um, Brazil Institute will be open always also to, to welcome presentations of, of proposals of those books. And hopefully next year in Brazil week, we will be launching the second round of new publications of uh, Anthem Press. Thanks again, Caleric, for publishing with us and to be here presenting your book together with Luciana. Thanks, David, for the great work, both with the conference and with this book that is a uh, makes the, the, the collection very strong. And thanks very much, Filippi, for the partnership, friendship, and collaboration with this great book and this great research work that you have done here. And also, uh, I must say that Filippi has been recently appointed the deputy director of Brazil Institute also, so for, for sharing the, the, the work of Brazil Institute with us. And well, we still have two events for Brazil Week this Friday. In one hour, we'll have uh, the launching of the, of the research clusters of Brazil Institute, some innovation in the governance and research agenda of the Institute. And later we'll have a book launch um, by Damien Platt, also another book about Brazil. Please look at our webpage and stay tuned for events that we have uh, in Brazil Institute for the coming year. Thank you all again and see you.